the topic of driving is kind of a tricky one, and it's a delicate one, and it's not an easy conversation ever to have with with any of my patients. And uh, people often regard this as the last uh, tier of uh, maintaining independence, and and uh, especially here in Southern California, where driving uh, is just part of daily life, like breathing almost. Uh, it's something in public transportation is not uh, easily accessible or all that expensive. Uh, the ability to drive uh, and drive safely is uh, really of importance to most of my patients, if not all. When I see my patients, there's always a lot to talk about. Um, as you're aware, if you have Parkinson's disease yourself or if your spouse or loved one has Parkinson's disease, you know there's a lot of things to, to fill the doctor's visit with. Um, or if you're seeing a nurse practitioner, healthcare providers visit. Now, there are motor problems that are troubling. Uh, somebody I saw just moments ago was being bothered by their tremor, which is usually what brings people to see uh, a neurologist in the first place. But there are the motor problems. Also, the, the another patient I saw earlier today, uh, the balance problem is most troubling to him. There are a lot of non-motor manifestations of Parkinson's disease, as you are well aware, the sleep issues that occur in Parkinson's disease, the problems with bladder and bowel function, there can be skin changes in, in Parkinson's disease. It's a very efficient, uh, this diagnosis is a very efficient tormentor of people, uh, basically and, and literally from head to toe and uh, day and night. Um, so there are things that I, uh, I need to know about when, when people come to see me. There are things that my patients and their family members, their spouses, their caregivers want to discuss with me as well. Um, but among those topics, the, those, that long list of things uh, should be driving. And I, I have to say, at least from my experience, uh, uh, I, I don't think that the primary care doctors necessarily are bringing this up. Um, I think they are waiting for me or uh, people like me to have a discussion with my patients about their driving. Uh, when they have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, it has been my experience as well that family members and understandably are the people who uh, initiate the conversation. So it, it, in my personal experience, and I'm, I'm curious to hear from other people as well, and I've talked to my colleagues about this around the country, the, the conversation was about driving is usually initiated by me and, and not by my patients, not by their spouses, not by their kids. Um, it started by things that I ask patients about routinely. Um, and and I'll, uh, the, the rationale behind that is uh, there are a couple of reasons, uh, fundamental reasons that I bring up driving routinely with all of my patients, whether they are early uh, and just recently diagnosed that so they've had Parkinson's disease for 10 or uh, 20 or more years, uh, I bring it up with everybody because we know that uh, people with this diagnosis are more likely to have uh, problems with uh, driving. And we know from some data that uh, people with this diagnosis are more likely to have accidents and injuries, inj damage to vehicles and, and physical injury to themselves or to other people. Um, so that, it, that has been established, and I think there's very little uh, argument about that. There's been some conflicting data about patients self-reporting about whether they're having accidents and also uh, data generated from carbon motor vehicles, for example. Um, some years ago, there was a report from the state of Kansas looking at this a publication that I happened to see, and they did report that people with Parkinson's were having more accidents compared to people of the same age. Uh, as people who the same age of people with uh, without Parkinson's disease. So it does come up. Another tricky thing about this conversation uh, with my patients is that oftentimes the patient himself does not recognize that they may be having a problem. Um, and that probably warrants uh, further thought and discussion why that would be the case. Why do people not recognize when they're having difficulty maintaining lane or judging distances and when to take their foot off the brake and put off the gas and put it on the brake, for example. But when I, when I brought up the uh, topic uh, with my patients, uh, oftentimes they will say they are safe and I sometimes will see a family member in the corner of my eye or in the corner of the room saying, not, yeah, they're not the case, they're not in agreement with that. And um, 
it's also interesting to me, I have several patients who are physicians or retired physicians who have Parkinson's disease, and they also fit that description that they're not recognizing when they're having difficulty with driving safety. So it's, it's known that this is a, a potential issue in people with Parkinson's disease. It is my experience that people with Parkinson's disease who are having difficulty uh, may not recognize that they're having safety issues with their driving. Uh, so I bring it up. And again, the, another reason why I bring it up is that there have been some uh, really sad, uh, tragic accidents uh, that have occurred in the state of California, which have involved people with Parkinson's disease driving. Uh, it's hard to know, was it the diagnosis that contributed to these tragic accidents? With, were there other factors? Um, but the, when somebody with Parkinson's disease is involved in a serious accident, uh, and for legal reasons, um, people are trying to assign uh, culpability or blame, uh, that diagnosis, if it's present, always comes up. Yeah. Or, uh, for that reason, I think it's also important to people, for people to be aware that this is not just a safety issue. Uh, of course, that's paramount to safety to themselves, safety to their family members, safety to other people on the road. But it, it can uh, be a legal matter as well. And I, unfortunately, I have seen that occur where people who were driving with Parkinson's and had an accident where somebody else claimed injury or they were injured. Uh, litigation can ensue and the uh, attorneys will focus on the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. In the state of California, uh, Parkinson's disease is a diagnosis that is supposed to be reported by the patient to the DMV. Most people aren't aware of that, but it is their obligation to bring it to the attention of the DMV. Certainly at the time of license renewal, they're supposed to list medical issues that may be having an impact on their driving safety. Another important point to keep in mind, if you read the package insert of the medications that you take for Parkinson's disease, there's a caution, I think, with all of them about drowsiness. And that too could have an impact on uh, driving safety. You know, the question, the, the hard part becomes, how do you determine if somebody's having difficulty or not? Their, their self-reporting may not be accurate. I was looking at literature last night and, and early this morning. What's been published recently in medical journals about driving with Parkinson's disease? Well, there, there's an abundance of literature. There's a whole bunch of stuff that actually uh, is in medical journals. And um, one of the, one of the uh, recent publications that's available online, but it's not yet in print, is from a journal called Neurology, which is the main journal of the American Academy of Neurology. And it's what's called a meta-analysis. Uh, it's a review of all publications that are pertinent to driving questions in Parkinson's disease, trying to reach some kind of consensus about how do we approach this problem. And there are a couple of interesting things that uh, I gleaned from reading this article. One is that, as I alluded to earlier, uh, uh, the database recording accidents, you know, damage to cars and injury to people uh, appears to be higher in people with Parkinson's disease, but when you ask individuals with Parkinson's disease about accidents, damage to cars, injury to people, it seems to be about the same as people who don't have Parkinson's disease. And this, the authors had some difficulty explaining why there would be this discrepancy, why the data from databases about accidents would be higher when people self-reporting would be about the same as those without Parkinson's and they don't really know the answer to that question <clears throat> could be that the people who are who've had an accident or or feel that they're at risk for having an accident have themselves stopped driving uh, could be that people are not recalling or withheld the information when asked about whether they were having uh, trouble or had had an accident they didn't want to reveal that to their doctor for fear that their license would be uh, removed so that's one of the interesting things. The other thing that I thought interesting from this article from Neurology, which is one of our main journals, was that they didn't really come to any consensus about who, how to evaluate people or who is it that is unsafe with Parkinson's disease. Their, their bottom line assessment after looking at all these publications that it's an individual decision, uh, that individuals have to be evaluated without any specific criteria, that there should not be laws passed or other specific criteria regarding this diagnosis. Another interesting paper that I pulled up uh, comes from Japan. 
on behalf, it says, of the Parkinson's Disease Safe Driving Study Group of Japan. So it's a, a worldwide discussion. And they brought to my attention in this article some, some other interesting things. They were trying to look for what other what are the things about Parkinson's disease that may be predictors for somebody being unsafe. And they thought that the likelihood of having an accident was uh, correlating with age of the patient. Uh, so older patients were more likely to have an accident. Disease duration uh, was something else that they thought was increased the likelihood the longer people had this diagnosis, which makes kind of sense. Uh, they also mentioned that the amount of medication people were taking seemed to correlate. So the larger the amount, the more likely. Uh, the, uh, the possibility of having an accident. Cognitive functioning as assessed by a couple of scales. One was the mini metal status examination, which has sort of fallen from favor and used in Parkinson's disease. There's something else called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which we commonly use in our clinical assessments of people and also in research studies, which is testing things like memory and arithmetic and uh, language, but also something called a trails test where you're connecting dots in a certain sequence. And I thought the people who were having difficulty with that were also more likely to have an accident. But the, the very interesting point that they found was that the motor score, the, the findings of tremor and stiffness and slowness and balance and walking uh, did not correlate to the risk of having an accident. So, uh, you know, patients will often say, well, when I'm in the car, you know, I I may have difficulty walking, but when I'm in the car, I can manipulate the steering wheel and the, the pedals quite well. Uh, but this study from Japan suggests that that could be misleading, that, that people who are doing fine with, with motor activity uh, could be at as high risk as somebody who's having a great deal of difficulty with the, the finger tapping, the hand opening, closing, the alternating hand movements, and testing the rigidity and so forth that we do in our clinical examinations. I have to say this is in agreement with my sense as well, that it's not really a motor problem so much as it is uh, a cognitive uh, issue. Um, the uh, cognitive issues that occur in Parkinson's disease include, and this can occur very early on in Parkinson's disease, can include things like difficulty with multitasking, you know, keeping many balls in the air at the same time and paying attention to several things simultaneously. Uh, visual spatial perception can be altered in people with Parkinson's disease, and commonly is. Uh, something that you may not notice if, that if you have Parkinson's disease is that attention can be altered as well. And if you think about it just for a moment, these are all critical functions in safe driving. Multitasking, attention, visual spatial perception, and these are all things that can be altered by Parkinson's disease. And these are not things that we commonly test in routine clinic visits. So you know, the question arises, well, how, how, do we, how do we detect people who may be putting themselves or others at risk while they're driving? Well, what I do is I ask spouses who, again, often don't want to be the, the, the you know, reporting negatively about their husband or wife, but I will ask the patient, how are you doing with driving? And they'll say oftentimes, fine. <laughs> And then I will ask the spouse, who I hope is at the visit with them, also in the room, I will say, uh, are they safe? Um, uh, do you have any concerns about their driving safety? And this really should be a discussion initiated at home, uh, independently of, of my questioning, but oftentimes it just doesn't come up somehow. So I ask spouses. I, I also want spouses to understand that, uh, how high the stakes are, that um, they put themselves at, at risk uh, <clears throat> for, you know, they put themselves at risk if they're a passenger in the car, they put themselves at risk if, there's, if their loved one has an accident and, and uh, somebody says, you know, they hurt me or I've, I've been hurt or my car has been damaged and litigation ensues. Not just the driver, it could be the spouse as well. And I have seen that, unfortunately, personally, that spouses have been sued because of <clears throat> injuries uh, uh, caused by their spouse with Parkinson's disease while driving. Uh, why did you not stop him or her? Uh, you were aware they had Parkinson's disease, you let them drive, and you didn't intervene, and so forth. How nasty it can get. So I ask 
the patient, I ask the spouse if there are children present for the visit, I will ask uh, them. I ask the patient, are there family members who are riding with you? Are, are they expressing concern about your driving safety? I sometimes ask a question, which is kind of uh, difficult, but I will say, do you have grandchildren? Oh, yes. And are they allowed to ride with you? And if somebody says, oh, no, <clears throat> we don't let the grandkids in the car, that's an indication to me that there is at least concern about driving safety. And of course, there are other people's grandchildren in other cars, not just with my patients. So that, that's, that's something that gives me pause when the, when the grandchildren are not allowed to ride in the car with my, with my patient. If there's uncertainty, if, if people express, well, I think I'm safe, or the spouse says, well, I think they're safe, I also ask them, have you had an accident, any fender benders, any uh, collisions in parking lots, have you had an accident on the road, uh, have you been uh, ticketed, have you had a citation, so I ask all these things. Uh, and if there's any concern that comes up, if there's uncertainty about driving safety, then I ask the patient um, to have a formal driving evaluation, and that can be done in a variety of ways. Here in Orange County, California, there are several locations that do formal driving assessments and have experience doing so. Uh, I have one or two that I've used over the years and do a very good job. They ride in the car with the patient and observe their behavior while they're driving and I think do a fair assessment. They're not there to take away the license of, of everybody that I refer to them. They are there to do a fair assessment of driving safety and they give me a feedback. They ask the patients, is it okay? or not to send that information to the DMV, and if the patient says no, then they don't, but they send the information to me. And if they detect something that uh, raises concern, they say so very explicitly, and then I have a conversation with the patients about how to proceed from there. Sometimes they say, after the driving assessment, they say, yeah, they're fine, but they should probably be retested in about a year or so. Sometimes they will say they're not fine and they should stop driving immediately and they can't drive home. Uh, or sometimes they do something in between. They say, well, they're pretty good, but they could benefit from some uh, brush up training. They could uh, probably be a good idea to take some driving lessons or, or going to the driving school for a few sessions, just to get, have, have some brush up on things like looking over your shoulder and making sure that you're using your signal for lane changes and so forth. And that's another outcome of that driving assessment. One of the difficulties of doing that is that it's not covered by insurance. It's an out-of-pocket cost and it's not cheap. The places that I send patients to cost in the range of about $600, which is a staggering amount of money for many people, I get it. But in the big picture, it's, uh, it could be regarded also as, some, as a well-spent uh, uh, amount of money, given all the trouble if somebody has uh, difficulty with Parkinson's disease, but they've not uh, taken any effort to identify uh, in terms of their driving and they get into an accident. Uh, the consequences of that would be uh, awful, potentially. So having this driving evaluation, although it's relatively costly, nobody wants to do it. I, I can understand that very well. Uh, in the big picture, it could be a relatively minor expense. That's how we mostly proceed here um, in terms of doing driving assessments. This is not, has not been my behavior throughout my career earlier. Like many of my colleagues, I was waiting for people to bring it up, but I, as I mentioned at the outset, they just don't. Uh, they don't bring it up themselves spontaneously. Some of my colleagues uh, will say, well, you know, this, the husband or the wife will, will mention it, and they just don't, uh, in my experience, bring it up. Uh, so I have to bring it up. And I, you know, I understand the impact uh, very well. I, my father is 90 years old. He doesn't have Parkinson's disease. He has another neurological diagnosis diagnosis and lives in a different state. He lives in central Pennsylvania. And some years ago when I was out visiting him, it was apparent to me that he was having difficulty with his driving. And I talked to him about it and he said, he's a retired professor, he's a smart guy. And I talked to him about his driving and he thought, no, I'm, I'm doing okay. Your, your, your concerns are, I appreciate your concerns, but they're not well founded. But I told him, okay, Dad, but I'm going to call your doctor and have a discussion with him, which I did. And the doctor, uh, who's an intern, is not a neurologist, but the doctor was uh, uh, kind of surprised by the call. But it's his intern, and the intern is checking his blood pressure, checking his cholesterol, and so forth. And 
My father's a very uh, good conversationalist. He spent his career as a professor and an administrator. He knows how to schmooze with people. And in the uh, you know, 10 to 15 minute visits, it was not uh, perceptible that he was having some cognitive issues that could impact his drive. But I, I called his doctor and told, expressed my concerns. And the doctor took, fortunately, took it very seriously. And, and uh, as a consequence, my father had some testing. Uh, of some cognitive testing and uh, DMV testing, which revealed he was not safe, and he had to stop. And he didn't like it. Uh, he didn't like me doing it. <laughs> but you know, you know, my my role as his son, of course, is to think about his well-being, uh, even if it's painful for both of us. And my role as a physician is also not just to treat the immediate problems that identify in clinic problems, but try as best I can to uh, foresee things that could be problems in the future and try to prevent them if, if uh, at all possible. I, th th there aren't any specific guidelines, and it varies from state to state about physician reporting, but there, you know, this is a tough thing, uh, that there aren't any specific guidelines about how to proceed in people. And I think the end, end result of this article from uh, the Neurology Journal is that it's an individual evaluation which I try to do, and I hope I'm being fair. I think I am. If there, It's one of the more difficult conversations I have you know, with my patients. I have it every day, multiple times. It's somewhat time consuming, but nonetheless, I think it's necessary. If there are questions or comments, I, uh, that pretty much is, concludes the remarks I wanted to make, but I'm happy to have a discussion if people have questions or comments. Dr. Hermanowitz, hi. We do have some questions, and one of them came up that um, people, you mentioned that in California, people are required to um, report to the DMV. Um, yeah. Is that also true of people with other movement disorders like dystonia and Huntington's and the essential tremor, or is that specific to only certain diagnosis? Um. Yeah, that would be the case with Huntington's disease, not necessarily the case with the essential tremor or dystonia. Okay. But but because both Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, Huntington's is uncommon. But both of those uh, diagnoses have both motor and sometimes cognitive impairment. Huntington's usually does have cognitive impairment. Actually, it's one of the earlier symptoms of Huntington's disease, earliest. So yes, that would be. And but unfortunately, the DMV is not very good about getting that information out, and neither are our physicians. You know, routinely saying, "Well, have you told the DMV that you have Parkinson's?" Disease? And I have to say, I don't do that myself. But if you read the fine print, on, and certainly in your license renewal, there is a section where it says, "Do you have any medical issues that the DMV should be aware of that could impact you to safe drive?" Thank you. Another question came: What things or behaviors? Do um, the driving assessment people look for on with a driving analysis of, um, you know, you're talking about that evaluation. What do they look for? They're, they're looking at uh, maintaining one's lane, uh, doing the head checks, uh, safety in entering intersections, uh, safety in making turns. So if somebody's making a wide turn and getting into the other lane, uh, that would be of concern. Um, one of my patients in the past. Uh, was basically straddling the center line while he was driving uh, down a uh, road. And although there was nobody else on the road, uh, that's still uh, thought to be not safe driving. Uh, so they're looking for people uh, following signs, doing head checks, using signals, uh, stopping in, in before entering an intersection where there's a crosswalk, if there's a stop sign or a stop line, you don't want to go cruise through the the crosswalk. So it's, uh, I think, fundamentally what we all went through uh, in our formal behind the wheel test for the DMV. Very similar. I see. Okay. And I would expect then that they, because they have more of an understanding of Parkinson's and neurological things, they may have a, a kind of depth of perception about what's causing these skills or lack of them that probably isn't right. present with the DMV test. Right. Yeah, the DMV is. Um, I mean, people ask me how can they, uh, how can they uh, be tested other than paying the fee. I, I suppose you could go to the DMV and ask them to test you. Uh, I have never had a patient do that. I have to say, I, I've discussed with them. Nobody's ever gone to the DMV and asked for a, a behind the wheel test. Um, I don't know that the people at the DMV really have the 
sensitivity to my patients that these other people who are occupational therapists, by the way, who are experienced in Parkinson's disease, I'm not sure they're as sensitive to the issues associated with Parkinson's disease uh, and would not necessarily uh, perform the test in the same fashion. Okay. And then um, since judgment is affected, you know, often with Parkinson's, not, not only just driving judgment, but just one's own, um, like you said, insight into their skills and so forth. Is there any way to kind of approach that for a, say, a spouse or a family member for the person with Parkinson's so that they might be receptive to that conversation? It's a tough one. That is hard. Um, and uh, it's uh, oftentimes, more often than not, the situation is the husband who has Parkinson's disease. I mean, more, more men than women have Parkinson's disease. But that situation where it gets kind of touchy uh, that I've encountered is more often it's the husband who has Parkinson's disease, who has been kind of the, uh, you know, an authority in the family, maybe the breadwinner or the main breadwinner, um, somebody who's been decisive throughout their life. And as I mentioned, you know, uh, several of my patients who have had this discussion with our physicians or retired physicians, and these are people who are accustomed to giving instructions and organization and checking and being cautious and so forth. And it's very hard to approach somebody like that and say, well, I'm concerned about your driving safety. Um, I would hope that, uh, that the patient and their spouse has a... <clears throat> has easy communication between the two of them. But, you know, quite frankly, that's not always the case. Um, I, I, you know, if there's concern and it's difficult to discuss, I would hope that the spouse would, would uh, take the doctor's side as they sometimes do with me, say I have concerns or send a, send a message and saying, you know, please don't. Tell my husband or tell my wife, but I, I would like you to discuss uh, driving with a patient uh, that has happened on occasion, and again, I just in my own practice, I have changed my own behavior. Um, as I kind of alluded, there was a just a not my patient, but a terrible accident some years ago, and somebody with Parkinson's disease, and it was eye opening. Uh, so I have taken this up, and people don't like to discuss it, but I, there are a lot of things that are unpleasant to discuss with Parkinson's disease, right? But I think we need to. I don't have any better advice about the, you know, the reluctant spouse, you know, how to bring mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then another question is, um, you spoke about how medications can make people sleepy sometimes. And yeah. Yeah. What about DBS? Does it have any sort of effect on driving skills? Not, not that has been studied. Um, not that I saw reported that DBS had some special uh, risk associated with it in terms of having an accident. One other medication side effect that was identified in this Japanese study was something called impulse control disorder. These are mostly associated with dopamine agonists. This is the compulsive gambling, shopping, spending, or sexual preoccupations that sometimes come out with these dopamine enhancing medications. And that did seem to correlate with a greater likelihood of having an accident. And just as an anecdote, <clears throat> years ago I had a patient who had impulse control disorder. And he was running stop signs and speeding in, in addition to the more other issues, but uh, you know, spending too much uh, on things that he didn't necessarily need or want. But it was also manifest as his driving behavior. I've heard that more than once, uh, that driving somebody with impulse control disorder can be uh, less safe. So it's important then to look at medications that for yeah. them. And yep. And uh, discuss that with their physician as well, because that might yeah. be an effect with just dire consequences. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's good to know. And um, I'm looking at some others. Uh, the, the people I know are concerned that about the isolation that can occur when someone yeah. is driving perfectly in Southern California, where you can't yeah. get here to there without getting any um what's a way have you got any suggestions for kind of how to if someone is going to stop driving kind of how to compensate for that what can be done yeah. to to um 
relieve the isolation that may happen. And also the burden on the spouse who now becomes the primary chauffeur. Yep. Yeah, those are all realistic uh, concerns and uh, weigh heavily upon people, including me. Um, it's never simple. Um, patients feel that they're, they're already imposing it by this diagnosis, and I get it. They already feel like they're putting a burden on their spouse. There's just no getting around that. That in fact is the case. We, we know that uh, this diagnosis doesn't just cause suffering in the person who has the illness. It can uh, cause some uh, difficulty with the spouse as well, the caregiver. Um, I think, though, that, that the, <clears throat> the concern that I've heard it expressed many times by my patients when I've had this discussion, I don't want to add more on my wife and my husband's plate. They've got enough dealing with it already. But I, I think they overstate it, or I think they overestimate what, how burdensome people think this will be. Uh, you know, I, I still want to go to you know, my group of friends. We play cards. We meet at a club or you know, every Thursday afternoon. And, you know, in the conversations I've had in my examination rooms with my patients and their spouse, the spouse usually will say, I don't mind. It's not that big of a deal. So to some extent, I, I think it's, it's over perceived it's perceived as being a bigger burden upon people around them than it is also friends and neighbors are often well yeah, i'll take you to the store if somebody if they're aware i mean i, I can't imagine you know people who has a friend or a close neighbor with parkinson's disease if somebody knew that they could be helpful they would you know, probably jump at the chance nobody wants to ask but i think it most people when asked or if they learn of the need they're very eager and happy to help out um, the other thing that's changed, uh, I, I have taken Uber countless times all over the country. So uh, when I go to meetings, I don't take taxis anymore. I, I, uh, my, my wife spends a lot of, you know, my wife is from Iceland and she spends a lot of time now that her kids are out of the house and her family's still there. And so she goes to Iceland and spends quite a bit of time there. And we decided, well, look at the, you know, why keep two cars when she's in Iceland? Uh, you know, a good part of the year, I'm going to be paying insurance and, uh, on that car that's sitting in the car. So we got rid of the second car. We have one car. So when she's in the United States, which is most of the time, uh, we're, we're, we have one car. And she works at the art museum. I work at the university. And if we have conflict of who gets the car, then somebody takes Uber. So I've taken Uber to work. I've taken Uber home from work. I take Uber to the airport. I uh, go to New York every year for the Fox Foundation meeting. I take Uber around New York. Uh, I, I take an Uber in San Francisco. It's uh, it's an expense, but it's less expensive than a second car, uh, and it's quite reliable. Um, I pull out my phone; it's not difficult to to use. So these riding programs, Uber, Lyft, etc., have made it you know much easier, I think, for people to get around. That's a good suggestion. I know I use Uber and Lyft all the time. They're, they're quite convenient. You don't wait. You can call them and light at your doorstep pretty quickly. They're very accommodating. And as you say, looking at what it costs to keep a car and, and insurance on it and the risk that may be involved with driving as well, it, it's a really yep. very useful kind of alternative. We yep. had one person say that they took a proactive approach early on. And uh, they very wisely realized that that, is, uh, that driving would be a decision they'd have to face in the future as the disease progressed. And so when they retired, they really um, looked at public transportation, Uber, biking trails, all kinds of different ways to get around town without using their car. And like you, they got rid of their second car. So. I think sometimes, um, especially now, the inconvenience is probably overestimated too, um, given the resources that are out there with public transportation and Uber. And also, um, the stress of driving, when one, even when one's confident about their driving skills, it can still be really stressful. And one of the things I appreciate is when I'm not driving, it's not nearly as stressful as when I'm behind the wheel. And That's awful. Yeah. <laughs> Here in Southern California, I mean, my, my patients say, oh, I don't want to give up driving. You know, I, I don't say this, but I think to myself, oh, boy, yeah, you know, is it that much fun? 
Yeah, yeah. It's not like you're on an empty highway, you know, just. I mean, you, you've got, you don't have to just worry about your driving, you have to worry about other drivers and their, the safety of their driving. It really is, uh, I get, I, I, I don't, I think it's more of a uh, sense of giving up something that they've had for years and years and years. They've been teenagers, and this is just a blow. I, we were at a young onset support group some months ago, and uh, somebody was saying, oh, don't, don't, don't take away my driving. This, this diagnosis takes away so much. Don't take away my driving. But if that person were to have an accident, uh, that takes away so much more. And actually, uh, I was there and I brought up that point. Had, had no knowledge of this before, but she was involved in litigation because of her husband's driving. And that's just so unpleasant. Yeah. I mean, people don't want to give up driving. I get it. You know, my father didn't want to stop driving, but it's if something bad happens, there's injury or there's litigation, it just becomes so bad. You know, I think one of the things, too, that I'm seeing in, in the comments is that from the spouses, how very often when they do suggest anything about driving, that the spouse with Parkinson's gets angry. And, yeah. and um, you know, I think sometimes, and, if, if, and then if they suggest that there's any sort of cognitive issues, um, they're not only saying they're physically maybe incapable, but also mentally, and yeah. judgment is impaired. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't, if you know of any magic pills to ease that situation, but I know <laughs> You know, I think that's why the it, it comes to me. Um, uh, I'm not exactly a neutral party, but I'm not the spouse uh, that they've they've been living with for 50 or more years. Um, and it's coming from a different point of view. It's coming as a medical recommendation, not as a critique of somebody's abilities or their personality or something. And I I, I get it. Oops, I'm sorry, you froze on me. Where is he? 